Thank you very much. We are now moving to the discussion on Israeli-Palestinian relations. I think the clip should come up. צהריים טובים גבירותיי ורבותיי, אנחנו עוברים עכשיו בשלב הזה לפאנל שעוסק בשאלה התמידית ואולי המטרידה ביותר בשנים האחרונות, האם אנחנו בדרך מפתרון שתי המדינות, הכה מפורסם והכה ידוע ומוכר לנו לכולנו, לפתרון של מדינה אחת עבור שני עמים. הפאנל הקרוב יתחלק לשניים, שני צוותים שונים בפרספקטיבות שונות. האחד יכלול מומחים, גם למזרח התיכון, גם לפוליטיקה בינלאומית, גם לישראלים כמובן, ואחר כך נדבר גם לפוליטיקאים, כדי לנסות ולהבין האם אנחנו נמצאים בדרכי למציאות שונה לחלוטין. אני שמח להזמין לפאנל הראשון את האורחים שלנו, נתחיל כמו ג'נטלמנים, רבותיי, אני מקווה שזה לא תיכנסו, שמרית מאיר. אני מתכבד להזמין את שמית העיר העיתונאית ופרשנית לענייני המזרח התיכון, מנכ"לית לינק. דייוויד מקובסקי, מוושינגטון אינסטיטוט, איש של משאים ומתנים לשלום. תת-אלוף במילואים מייק הרצוג. לשעבר רמת שר הביטחון וגם עמית מחקר בינלאומי בוושינגטון אינסטיטוט. ואחרון חביב, אריק ברבינג הריס, לשעבר ראש מרחב ירושלים ואיו"ש בשירות הביטחון הכללי השב"כ. הפאנל הזה, גבירותיי ורבותיי, יתנהל בעברית, למעט דייוויד מקובסקי שביקש לדבר ולתת את תשובותיו באנגלית, אנחנו כמובן נכבד את זה, ולא נבזבז זמן משום שהזמן שלנו קצר, אנחנו חייבים להספיק הרבה. נתחיל איתך שמרית בחריין מאחורינו, ועושה רושם שעשו את כל המאמץ האפשרי כדי לחסל את האופציה בכלל של הצלחה בגלל. Uh, for this conference. Sure, well, we're talking about the media and everybody else. Well, it depends on how do you define success. Conventional wisdom is there was a financial program, 97 pages long, very, very thorough. It's very, maybe we should keep it on our, in the computer, maybe in some uh, file, because they did very nice work. However, without a political aspect, this is headed nowhere. I'd like to challenge this perception and suggest something else. I think that the right thing to do If we do uh, evaluate, there, uh, there is no feasibility for a real political event, state event. Uh, in Israel, there is a prime minister who prides himself on the fact that for 10 years he has been uh, holding this option of a Palestinian state, not letting it uh, happen. On the other side, we also see a, a non, no willingness. It is a geographical and a very deep mental separation, there's no preparation of the population, very weak leadership, etc. So the two sides are not interested in this uh, broker shape or anything radical. So given this situation and assuming that you really want to better the life of the people living here, maybe the right and modest thing to do is uh, economic initiative. Is there a real explanation why the Palestinians uh, boycott it? Well, it depends who you are asking. For example, Abu Mazen will say, it goes without saying, and all, uh, all Arabs, uh, this is the Palestinian narratives, they stabbed us in the back, although I must say that they don't 
exactly understand what happened to them. This is one of the things that surprised me because you sh you would have thought that in a situation like that, Palestinians will uh, really, really look into the situation. They're isolated not from the large superpower in the world, but from the entire Arab support system they used to have. And there is no soul searching. Maybe it is being done only on the periphery. The Palestinians uh, were clear about the fact that they're not going to be part and parcel of this. They see the Americans as provocative. Uh, as uh, very extremely biased against them. What we saw in Syria was only the tip of the iceberg, and so they are completely boycotting it. The Palestinian approach to summit in one word, they're waiting for a force majeure. What's the force majeure? The solution that is uh, called Trump will resolve itself. Okay, let's hold it there. Uh, Brigadier General Mike Herzog, you dealt with peace, what we refer to as peace, I don't know if you recall, is there an option of having any dialogue between Israel and the Palestinians that will exercise to the fullest this idea of the two-state solution, or perhaps we have now entered this uh, period of time where this is over and gone. Right now, the, di the conditions for a dialogue or any breakthrough as was stated earlier, the two leadership, leaderships are not interested. There is no trust. There are no. Uh, there's no dialogue, and I think that the two parties don't want the American government to simply drop on them this plan. They don't know how to deal with it. You're asking a question of principle. Um, if we had different leaders, is this impossible anymore? And this is a highly complicated question. We're now after 25 years and a whole line of series to try and break through, including some very bold attempts, at least three or four that are very, very meaningful. And the fact that we were not successful it makes the two societies grow tired of it. And there is more and more this narrative of we can never reach there. And it is no choice that you also went for this title. Are we on the verge of one state? And I think that a very deep, thorough analysis of what makes up the ability to uh, break through towards there. We have to look at the political views of the leaders. We have to look at things as they are in reality, in the field. We have to see where the two societies are. It's true, but I am stopping you here because I want to stay on the level of the headline before we go deeper into it. But on the level of the headline or perception or title, did we strive towards a two-state? Did we want to separate? Are the Palestinians now saying to the for, uh, let's work towards a unification? Why shouldn't we be Israelis? Why shouldn't we vote? I think that throughout time, this is the process we see on the Palestinian side. There is more and more support of what they refer to as a one-state solution with equal rights to all. I see a difference between the older generation and the younger one. With the older generation, it is a threat on Israel. You don't want to give us a state okay so we'll go for a one state uh, solution but they don't really believe in it and i have many many years of experience of negotiating with these people with the young generation it's different and i talk to them and i meet them and i see young people who believe that this is the solution including abu mazan's son and many others i think that as a historical trend uh, provided there are that there is no action that is leading towards separation we'll see more and more support for that and run last sentence i fear that with days we're going to see an international support of one man, one vote, including in the United States. So uh, the Americans have a team that is dealing with this, uh, the Trump program. Are they um, completely disconnected from reality? Do they really believe still in this plan? I think you have to say here, make the distinction between the president himself and maybe others around. I think the president's self-image is one of the greatest negotiator in the world. And this issue, for good or for bad, is like the World Cup, the Super Bowl, the World Series, all wrapped together. So how can the greatest negotiator not deal with this issue? So this has been his dream. If you look at like within the first few weeks of him being a candidate, he says, this is the one I want to do. Um, so I think he really wants it. The fact that they did the Bachrein conference and I was there, I, I felt that they rolled this out separately, the economics, because they knew the, the political issues, the final status issues would hit, I think, a brick wall, and this, and it could explode things. Um, the parties were not where they would have liked, 
But David, where are they taking us, the Americans? Because we heard President Trump talk about one state and then two states. Are the Americans leading the two sides towards this track of a two state? Or maybe they're not interested at all? The president wants to do the two states. I think, I think he believes it. But my fear is that if this paralysis keeps going on, the Palestinians will give up. Mike made the distinction between the older generation and the younger generation. Even you're hearing people like Hanan Ashrawi and some others saying it's not about land anymore, it's about rights. My fear in the United States, to be, I'm going to be, I, I'm not usually an alarmist person, I'm usually pretty moderate, but I really worry that this thing is heading in a direction where the Palestinians throw up the, you know, the white towel and say, forget it, we don't want two states, we just want the vote. That is an atomic bomb on the American Jewish community and I think ultimately on Israel. Because the DNA of America is one person, one vote. It's going to be impossible to sustain democratic support. We'll talk more about this later this afternoon. Uh, and even maybe post-Trumpian Republican support uh, because people will start using the A word with Israel uh, in the way they have apartheid. not. Yes. Yes. You talk about an apartheid. I'm, I'm worried that the Israeli public is so worried about the tactical issues. BDS is like kinderspiel. It's kid, child's play. That's a hill. This is a mountain. If the paradigm changes America, don't say that because they're uh, trying to uh, no, scare us with BDS on Israeli good TV. About BDS, of course. Uh, but I'm saying this is a, a huge paradigm shift that will have huge implications, and I worry we'll isolate Israel and, and America in a way that we've never seen. Okay. I hope I'm wrong. Okay, we'll talk about separating Democrats and the Republicans and the gap that is growing wider between Israel and the liberal Jews. But Arik, let's go down to the field, so to speak. You are so familiar with the Palestinians as much as possible. On the Palestinian street, what do they want? What are they talking about? After so many years of negotiations, after Arafat and Abu Mazel and Camp David and whatever, and what have you, are they still interested in their own state? First, I think that they are still interested. They are very much so in. I talk about the young generation. They're living on the internet. They understand very well what's happening in the Middle East. They understand what's happening around them. They understand the rights and their um, obligations. They really want to have an independent state. One of the leaders said, and they said it in Arabic. What does that mean? Even if you are a deluxe occupation, you're still an occupation. And the Palestinians and stressing on the young generation, the internet generation, the one that is connected to media and digital, they have an aspirations to have an independent entity. Moreover, they don't want to have an Israeli identity uh, card. Well, you're trying to call us this option that we are so afraid of is the Israeli and Jews and Zionists. This is not what the young generation wants. I think that the young generations want to have their Palestinian ID card and not an Israeli one. They want equal rights. They want all the conditions that Tel Aviv can provide, not the ones that they have in Damascus, because the point of uh, relation of this young Palestinian is going to the center of Israel, is not going eastwards because of these changes that occurred, and they don't need the Israeli ID card. They want their own independent state with police forces and everything else that the, the state can provide. They do not believe in their current leaders. They don't believe in it. They view it as partially corrupted or completely disconnected, and they understand that they don't have the leadership and the strength to bring about the change. This is actually a mirror uh, view of what we see in Israel. The two leaderships don't really want to achieve. OK, I'm staying still on the level of the street, so to speak. Those young people who are highly frustrated by their leadership, they're interested in political independence. Are they building upon some alternative of leadership? Maybe not today or tomorrow, but 
in a year time or several years time there is new leadership it is mostly developing at the refugee camps where Palestinian rule is not as strong it is a leadership that has some characteristics of the old generation those who have a weapon those who have power or money and I see mostly at the north of the bank Janine Nablus and the villages less so at the south there of the bank I see militias I see groups who are in under certain situations and it's very difficult to pinpoint when it's going to happen this leadership could become the leadership that will go out to the street and sweep all the young people. I think that right now there is not enough energy for many, many reasons uh, for this leadership to lead the way. Is this a radical leadership that views a weapon as a means, as a way to reach political uh, achievements? It is a radical one because it is young. It is the generation that is referred to after Zakaria's baby, which I think people are familiar with. And so there's no problem of gathering the young people because they'll talk to them about things that are are not moderate. Moderate is not acceptable that much. And the fear is that at a certain point in time, a situation will come about where this leadership is going to take the young people to a clash or create a clash. I think that right now, for many reasons, particularly because it's not an interest of the Palestinian Authority or the uh, security forces, the second uh, reason being that cooperations between Israel and Palestinian security makes uh, a kind of quiet, more than a relative uh, peace and quiet in the Judea and Samaria. And this quiet, Shimrit Meir, this allows the Israeli political leaders to sweep this under the rug. Uh, now, the narrative, the Israeli political narrative, is that Abu Mazen is no partner. Do you see Abu Mazen as a partner of anything? Well, I'll phrase it differently. I'd like to refer to the essence of our discussion and say that I do agree with what have been said. I don't see the Palestinians going towards a one state uh, as their ticket. Maybe not yet. Maybe it's yet to happen. Well, either you want independence, you fight for it, or you want an Israeli ID card and national security. The two cannot go together. And moreover, the two societies, and particularly Palestinians, millennials, and we saw three years ago when we had the Facebook Intifada or the Knives Intifada, you couldn't really walk on the streets, spontaneous things that are not organized, but they come from the web. The young Palestinian generation is really distanced from the Israeli happenings. And I saw the ceremony at the Birzeit University. It didn't feel like Tel Aviv University at all, but rather an aspiration to be part of the Gulf. This is uh, the point of reference. The distance between the two societies, and there is another huge thing we're not discussing, which is Gaza. Two quasi-Palestinian quasi states, one in Gaza, one in, on the bank, and they're different. And because of the 12 years of political distance, there are distance also on the level of society. So at the height of escalation vis-a-vis -vis Gaza, missiles and attacks of the Air Force on Gaza in Ramallah, they demonstrated about their own national security situation. So uh, at the question of Abu Mazen, I'll say the following. So there are two Palestinian entities, and there is nothing we can do about it. And it's not because of Netanyahu, no. Netanyahu, I one of the greatest achievements of Netanyahu, as he views it, is that he is going to leave behind him, assuming that he finishes his uh, term today. The Palestinian project is completely deconstructed at a horrible stay situation. It is internally uh, dismantled, and uh, externally there is an anti-Palestinian dialogue in the world. And it's not marginalized, but it is mainstream. This gives uh, more strength to the Israelis. It does. And it is a phenomenon that did not start with Muhammad ben Salman and not even with the Sisi. Its, its root is in the Arab Spring, where everything was out for discussion. So just a second. If I understand what Arik and you are saying, this topic of a one state still did not make it to the big league, so to speak. Maybe reality is taking us there as a leadership that is going to respect a different thing. But it's not a, a, a banner. 
it is not something that has any uh, widespread hold. And it is also a conflict. Either you fight for uh, independence and freedom, or you want to be like the 1948 Arab, which, which they refer to as the Arab citizens in Israel. It doesn't have a hold. I think it's more of a scare kind of a thing, Abu Mazen. Now, Abu Mazen is an interesting uh, thing, because the Palestinian uh, system is in stagnation, nothing is moving, and it cannot when the head, he's 84 years old, the head of half the system, uh, his uh, high days are behind him, and everything is put at a hold right now. And a young leadership or an interim leadership or something, nothing is moving. When is it going to happen? When something bad happens, as Alex said, when the weapon, uh, the refugee camp started uh, fire, starts firing. Well, the weapons there uh, is there, but ultimately a leader needs uh, two things, either a consortium or a group of leaders. Uh, the day after Abu Mazen, they need the weapons, and so refugee camps are super important, and it's all fine, and they, uh, they need also legitimacy. They also need legitimacy, and so the real play, if you think that everything is done already and Netanyahu is leaving ruins, uh, behind him uh, regarding the Palestinian leadership. It's true, but it's going to be reopened. And politics is a pendulum. It goes in both directions. I think it's going to reopen the day after Abu Mazen in the uh, West Bank as well as Gaza. OK, now a question to both of you. We were, um, for many, many years, we knew that the um, international system and the American system have a lot of influence. And the Europeans who completely uh, disappeared regarding the Palestinian issue. Mike, where are they? What do they want? One word regarding the one state. Everything ties together. I think we need to differentiate between the situation currently and uh, the way the process is uh, going, where it is taking us. I'm following polls on the Palestinian street for many, many years, and I see that the process is of a rise in supporting this idea. Uh, if you look at uh, polls that have been held in the past two years, you see that over 40 percent support this idea. I ex I um, agree with my colleagues. There is still to be a critical mass in order to become active. But as a historical process, I think that the more time goes by and there is no breakthrough towards separation, and the more the Palestinian population um, gives up on any chances of uh, going in that direction, I think that support of this idea is going to uh, gain more and more momentum. I listen to the Europeans. They talk about two states. I was in Berlin several months ago. They said, this is our ticket. Uh, we take care of, we, of the Jewish state. Is this true? Well, Europeans currently are not a meaningful player at all regarding this Israeli-Palestinian dialogue. There's only one dominant player, and it's the United States, the Trump administration. And we orient ourselves towards uh, that and use, view it as wanting what? Well, the Trump administration for two and a half years has been working on a plan. We have not seen it yet, but only its economic portion. Obviously, this plan, as Jared Kushner said, is lies somewhere between the Arab Peace uh, Initiative and the stand viewpoints of the Israeli leadership, it, uh, maybe with an inclination towards the Israeli views. I think there is an anomaly where we are all waiting for about uh, three years' time. Maybe it's going to even happen after the elections in the United States, and we're doing nothing as if it's not our problem. We're waiting for the third party. We are waiting for them to come about with another plan and tell us what to do. Maybe the Americans are captivated in the Israeli concept of Netanyahu, and they take uh, let him lead the way, uh, choose his timing, choose whatever is good for him. I think that the Trump administration has a great leverage on the Israeli administration. They did many things for the benefit of Israel, like recognizing the Golan Heights, uh, shifting the embassy to Jerusalem. And I think that the current government will find it very difficult to say no unless they take it to an impossible place. However, I still do not understand what is the strategy. What do they really want? 
from the state of Israel here. I am yet to see where they say, okay, you owe us, and so we're asking you to do this and that. So Shimrit is right. Uh, Netanyahu is shaping our area, shaping the Middle East is actually um, portraying what is to be. No doubt, Netanyahu has a great influence of shaping the American plan, and I think that out of all uh, entities and factors in our area, he's most influential uh, in this respect. I think Trump actually believes he can do this. I don't know, I don't see others confident that he can do it. And I tend to wonder if they do come out with something in November, uh, I think A, they could delay it to a second term. If it comes out in November, it's very possible because of the 2020 elections in the United States that it's not an actual plan, it's a vision, meaning it's a speech that says this is a historic reference point for future administrations. We're not expecting the parties to negotiate it now because the gaps are too wide. I think the question, is, though, is less, you know, and there will be conspiracy theorists who say, of course, the administration wants it to fail. People like David Friedman and others would like to see it fail so Netanyahu could then justify the failure to start annexing certain settlement blocks, Bushim, uh, et cetera. But I think the real issue is more for Israel, which is the, the, the Zionist ethos was always Israel takes its destiny into its own hands. It doesn't wait for the United States, Europe, or whoever it may be. And if this is going to a, a one-state situation, uh, you know, each side uses the word one state in 180 degrees difference. When the settlers say one state, they mean Israel controls everything. When Palestinians use the word one state, often there is no Israel. I mean, Israel has a role here to play too. And as opposed to saying, we'll just wait for the Americans to do nothing. Um, I think the Zionist ethos was always, how to start taking your fate in but your but hands. That's right. Inaction is action. And now back to the street, but not only the street. I'm a little afraid that whether it's one or two state solution, but it's going to go on the path of a bloody third intifada. And I hear resonating in my head what you said earlier. Perhaps we need to go through the worst in order to get to the better. Unfortunately, only an event that is very difficult to foresee. It could be an internal Palestinian event. It could be something that develops from unrest in the street. Could bring us to something igniting in the field, mistakes made by the Palestinians or by the IDF and the I or the ISA. And ultimately, this could bring us to some kind of round of one kind of another. I don't know if it will be a third intifada, but it could be a major event, unlike anything we have experienced in, since 2004 or five, which will lead us ultimately to sit down to a negotiation table. We hear your colleagues in the ISA warning time after time. Things look quiet. They seem to be under control because the ISA is active in the field, but it could erupt. Yesterday, I was in the cabinet, and we said at the cabinet, it's been made public, that under the surface, there are currents that in certain situations could escalate in the street. It will most likely be the younger generation. It could sweep up people very quickly because of the media and the technology are very major actors in the Palestinian street, and they could lead to that. And if we continue to preserve the current situation without any change, we are today providing many local solutions, gestures, but things that are very local, very specific. They don't give the comprehensive solution. We could find ourselves in a situation that no one anticipates, but we could find ourselves in a state of escalation. And that's why we propose that the political levels use the convenient political situation right now to get involved in some kind of dialogue. 
But we're seeing, and we look back, we see the same thing, that only in extreme situations do we manage to engage in some kind of dialogue that enables us to reach some kind of settlement. With all the importance of the security, the motivation of the leadership on both sides is lower. In other words, you're seeing signs of an, in, an unwillingness to be proactive on both sides in order not to take risks, and stagnation is better than doing something. It's been working for a number of years. It could continue to work. It involves a lot of risks. If we continue this way, the risks are growing. There's no problem for the Palestinian security apparatuses to break up, that the street could break them up, and to start with all kind of events of the kind that we experienced in 2000 and 2001. And then we'll sit down and talk. Yes, and then we'll sit down and talk. I'm being told that our time is up, and we'll need, we'll just have a quick round. The question is very short. What's going to happen? Where is all this leading? We'll start with David Makovsky, and let's put on the heading of this uh, panel, a deal of the century or one state solution. That the administration will give a speech in November. I don't see at this late phase in the administration that they're going to be able to, um, you know, really catalyze um, a serious negotiation at this point. They may say this is a second term problem. Uh, I know people like Jason Greenblatt, and we're going to be hearing from him later have tried, and it might be delayed, but uh, unless there's something actual, not just a speech, I, I am worried that Israel is moving towards a one-state uh, situation. I don't think Israel will give the Palestinians the vote, but it will create enormous pressures in the United States that we've never seen before. Energy is in the street. We saw this with the moving of the uh, embassy, Bahrain, but there's no stamina. People aren't willing to go out into the streets for something external. They're accepting the blows from the Trump administration with kind of acceptance. What could get people out into the streets is an internal event, it's something perhaps in the extreme could be like in Syria, but it could get to something that will get out of control and radiate towards us. I find it difficult to imagine up to 2020 when the Palestinians say, let's wait Trump out and see what will happen. And if the pendulum moves in the other direction, then we'll be moving into a completely different ball game. The Palestinians, either it will come very much from the bottom up, or they will wait for this terrible thing, which is the Trump administration, as far as they're concerned, will be replaced, if not in 2020, then in 2040. Or if not in 2028. I don't think the American plan, if and when it is presented, will indeed lead us to some kind of breakthrough. I think we all agree that the parties are unwilling and unready for uh, such a program. And it might cause more harm than benefit. I think, I don't think that among the Israeli public there is a genuine discussion of the alternatives between separation and annexation. There's no real discussion. Everyone has to think about what the meaning is and discuss the alternatives. And I'm sorry to say that it's not happening. At the end of the Abu Mazen period, and it could happen before Trump ends his administration. It could be it could be a very dramatic event or it could be a process. It could end dr dr democratically or in chaos. It's a very sensitive thing and very risky thing and we have to be very much aware of that, although it is difficult to measure or identify in advance what the processes that will be created from that situation are. It could change the whole theater. If the leadership, which has already been marked, there are people perhaps we are less familiar with, it could change the narrative. In Abu Mazen's narrative or his strategy is no to terror, and that strategy is, is uh, 
uh, trickling down. People are waiting to hear. The second, second point is the Gaza Strip. Any event of this kind, especially in the context of the end of the era of Abu Mazen, the Gaza issue becomes an independent one, unconnected, in my opinion, to what will happen in Judea and Samaria and vice versa, unless there is some leadership that can connect the both parts, it can put Israel in a very sensitive situation, but that's why we have the ISA and the police and the IDF. In other words, all we don't, all we're missing is political leadership. Once again, good day, thank you for joining us. You heard the previous panel. I saw you in the audience listening carefully. We'll start with the lady. You come from a political camp that believes that there is an alternative and a political option to the, what we call the Palestinian problem. You're no longer the, hair, the chair of merits, but you're looking at the reality. You say, yes, can we reach, reach a political solution to states for peoples? I think the uh, solution, reaching that solution is becoming more difficult from one day to the next, especially in light of the reality in the field. The government has made great efforts to prevent that solution from taking shape. Do I still believe? Yes, I do. Not because I'm naive, because naive people are idiots and I'm not an idiot, uh, because I believe that's the right thing for the state of Israel. I'd just like to say something in wake of the previous panel. We're talking about two leaderships, Netanyahu's leadership and Abu Mazen's leadership. Neither of them want to move in that direction. And I find it difficult to, with this sym symmetry created between the two sides. We're not in a state of symmetry. We're in a state where we're, Israel is 71 years old and, s and Israel is controlling uh, millions of people in the territories. This, there is no symmetry. Uh, you, we say today the alleged occupation. That's what we say today. So, you know, we're talking about the, uh, uh, the light that uh, shone on the face of the American ambassador, who's more of an ambassador of the settlements, when he broke down that wall with that hammer in that Palestinian house in Silwan. And I'm trying to think, do we have an honest broker? It's very clear that we don't. The policy is very clear. Uh, but I would like to make one more comment further to the previous discussion. We're discussing here whether there's possibility of a one-state or two-state solution, what direction the process is moving in. We talked a lot about the Palestinian side. So on this matter, I have one more thing to say. I think that we, that you ignored, perhaps it's our discussion, ignored the Israeli side. I deliberately left that for this discussion, so I would like to discuss that. We see not only action on the ground, we're seeing an entire discourse that's being held here in recent years, a, dis a discourse of annexation uh, on the practical level, if I may. A few days before the dispersal of the Knesset, the prime minister, we all know, tried to survive and went to a, a package deal of an immunity law and so on and so forth in, in return for annexation. Immuni immunity in return for annexation, that's what he promised the right so that he could survive. Why am I starting with that example? The subject of annexation is is creeping in. The Likud Convention decided on it a few years ago, and I believe it is leading in the direction of an apartheid state. And the discourse of annexation, you remember Bennett and Shaked said, we're not talking about the two-state solution. We're talking about imposing sovereignty. We're not talking about a settlement or evacuation. And that is filtering down to Israeli society that annexation is legitimate. Gershon Hakoin, if I have understood correctly what you say and write, I listen to you and I read what you write, you talk about other options as well, not only two states and not only one state and not only annexations or evacuations. You're telling us that there are other 
options. Uh, absolutely. In many senses, first of all, the paradigm of how I see the expanse being arranged is not a, 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 a arrangement like a kibbutz, that you have the, the farm and you have the residential areas. And if I try to raise chickens in the residential area, they'll tell me that I that I'm confused. That's a very German way of looking things. It's mechanical and it's very wrong for us. I'm going back to previous times in this matter. If we go back to the time of Tabenkin and Manja Shochat, Manja Shochat was also against the fence that the British built on the Lebanese border. She said, Ibn El Balad living in the expanse, I'm not afraid of the Arabs, and I don't think that Israel can continue to exist in the 1967 borders, not only in terms of security. You're not afraid that the Zionist dream, that this entire Zionist project will be swallowed up by this expanse and become a non-Jewish state? No, it will continue to be Jewish, as Ben-Gurion said, that a Jewish state is Jewish not only in terms of the number of heads, because a Jewish state is not a liberal concept, because Ben Gurion and Mapai were not liberals in their basic ontology of how they perceived civil society. My point of departure says that when I look at reality, there are lots of options and possibilities. In Arabic, they say there's nothing better than what we have right now. Rabin is created a dynamic that we can move ahead with. Gaza is a state de facto, and I'm fine with that. And Gaza should be developed separately. Judea and Samaria have a type of autonomy in areas A and B. The argument is over the expanse outside of A and B, and I need that area because I see that the state of Israel is very overcrowded, especially in the next 20 years. And Professor Shimon Shamir said, how did we live before 67 in those borders? Uh, and we were, didn't feel overcrowded. And I said to him, when you were three years old, how did you wear a three-year-old's clothes? And they fit you. But we're, we have to say, we're very overcrowded. We need three million Jews in Area C. Ecologically, it's a single expanse. The electricity of the Palestinians use comes from Israel in the, within the green line. All the pollution comes to us. Uh, transportation, uh, you need to have an overall expanse for both areas. There's no way to have two viable states between the Jordan and the Mediterranean. There's no room for two viable states. And here we need to make a lot of creative arrangements, and we can be creative. So what are you saying? One state? I'm saying three, four states. Autonomies, and there are a lot of possibilities, and everything is open, but not two schematic states. That is not viable. Amos Gilad, you are familiar with this expanse for over 40 years. And you've always been a kind of a doomsday person. What should we do in order to survive so that Zionism will continue to flourish? And you don't agree with Gershon Hakohen. That's my guess. Are you afraid of a single state? First of all, I like Gershon. I don't agree with him on anything. I'd like to tell you what I think is going to happen here. I think we're already in the middle of a process, and the process began when we signed an agreement with Arafat, a murderer. I always recommended murdering him, killing him. In the end, I was an emissary to him. You can't hold negotiations. He wasn't interested in peace. And Abu Mazen, who's against terror and violence, no one talks to him. That's crazy. But unlike what my good friend Gershon says, I believe that the Palestinian Authority ultimately will disappear. Why? Because it lives, it's, it's lives on the agreement between us and PLO. What happened in Bahrain? It was a very glittering event, but politically it will produce nothing. Here too, they're saying Abu Mazen is corrupt, as if the others aren't corrupt. 
not here. And they say, okay, he's corrupt. He, he said, would you be willing to buy Palestinian nationalism for money? No, there's a process here. What is the process? We, together with the Palestinians, we are becoming a single entity, with the exception of atomic power that could threaten us, the demographics could threaten us. I believe that Hamas is dangerous, not because of the fire balloons, but because of the alternative they're offering. You're against terror, but you're a failure. We're in favor of violence and terror, and we will succeed, because that's the language the Israelis understand. So if that happens, we will be a country that will lose our majority. And if the PA collapses, we'll have to restore the military government in order to safeguard the security of Israelis. Of course, who can keep order here? The IDF, and that's what the IDF will do instead of training to fight Iranians and so on. I was twice Kogat, the coordinator in the territories. I developed an illusion that all the Palestinians would vote for me if I would suggest myself as their leadership, but I didn't have the guts to test that illusion. But Abu Mazen is the same. He has a mistaken, uh, he thinks that he's gonna last forever, but he won't. He was a friend of Shimon Peres, you know. He's in a very bad mood. Uh, he considers himself a political shaheed, and he's not preparing a successor. That means there's no future for the PA. I'd just like to go back to the bottom line. I think that we are already moving in the direction of a reality in which we and the Palestinians will be a single entity. One man, one vote. We could just commit suicide if we gave one man, one vote, you know, like whales in New Zealand. We'll be beaching ourselves on like whales. You're saying we're going to be a single entity, but they won't vote? Nobody will let them, and if they let them, we'll no longer be around. I'll tell you something, I don't think it was mentioned because it wasn't at the focus. Jordan, if there is an earthquake here, Jordan itself will be at risk. The expanse that call, that's called the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan, that, the whole area from the Mediterranean across the Jordan is Israel's strategic depth. The number of Palestinians there is very large. We don't know exactly, there are no formal numbers, but let's say it's two-thirds. What will we do with Jordan? I'd say we'll be in big trouble. You can tell me I'm a, I'm, I'm a doomsayer, but this is the situation. We've started the process. For us, Jordan is a security uh, uh, um, asset for us. And they're also connected to the Palestinians. If we have unrest and Abu Mazen, which the politicians aren't talking to, only the heads of the security forces are talking to him. They talk to Arafat, and they're not talking to him. He is coordinating to save Israeli lives, and in return, no one talks to him, and they're cutting back his uh, resources. Before Hamas, they're cutting his resources. In the end, he won't be. And if I'm right that he's not gonna live forever like he thinks he is, I think it could be very bad. And that's the strategic process. That's my professional opinion. Gershon Akon, of course, I'll let you respond, and I'm sure you have something to say. But, madam, I take an advantage of your political experience and ask you what happened politically. In 1993, there were the Oslo agreements. Israel was on a very hopeful uh, political route with a desire to reach agreements, and since then there's been a deterioration to stagnation, which is to put it mildly. You, as someone from the left, didn't you make a mistake there in the left when you held on to Oslo and uh, agreements when buses were blowing up? And that's how you lost the Israeli public. First of all, I'm sure we did, must have made of mistakes. I don't know anyone who didn't make, doesn't make mistakes. Is the strategic goal of a Palestinian state alongside Israel, has that changed? No. I think this whole discussion, I think it's delusionary to think that, as Gershon said, that two nations that rivers of blood flow believe them can live in the reality of a single state in light of everything that's been said here. He didn't say one state, he said two, three, four. 
I'm, I'm talking about the heading of this session. To say one state that can perhaps be attractive to certain groups, and I know groups in the left who also talk about one state. There are people who have given up, in my opinion, who who've despaired of any other solution. We can't have a reality which is not apartheid in such a situation. And I think from here I'd like to make a comment that looks at Israeli society. But you're evading the matter of responsibility because when the leadership loses contact with the developing reality, certainly of the security, certainly when there are terror attacks and buses and restaurants are blowing up, and you keep talking about peace, peace, and separation and agreement, perhaps that's where you lost the public, and it's your responsibility. What do you mean my responsibility? I don't remember when we were in power, and I say that with great sorrow. Uh, the ones who were in the power, at least in the last decade and much longer, is the right that was in power. And I didn't see any a diplomatic initiative on the part of the Prime Minister other than the Barilan speech, which was only lip service. He talked about two states. What happened from then? He had to pay lip service to the American administration. He doesn't believe in it. He was captive of the extremist settlers. And I'd like to say one more thing. We're ignoring a very important point. We're talking about what's happening in the territory and the government in the territories. And if we'll read the situation of two states or one state, and we occupied the territories, and we never realized that it was the territories that occupied us. And it's something that we're ignoring. And this entire Dorse course, if there'll be one state or two states, what we're seeing today is that in order to continue to maintain what's happening in the territories, we are crushing the Israeli democracy. We are dividing up the Israeli population into loyalists and traitors. Those who support a Palestinian state are traitors. And so you have to crush everyone, the media, the free media, the, court, the Supreme Court. And that leads us to a situation where the discourse of annexation is being perceived as legitimate. And we have a rifted society that ultimately is not accepting the fact that our strategic goal should be to reach two states. First of all, my point of departure for peace is very much in the daily friction of life and not in ceremonies on the White House lawn. And the big difference between Begin alone, Be Machen Begin and Yigal alone, and all those who are against the Sadat Begin Camp David box, not because of the destruction of the, of the settlements, but especially, and as Yigal alone put it so well, he didn't want the finality uh, of, that Begin sought for. There is no finality. You know, you sign an agreement, tomorrow's a new day. What you heard here doesn't frighten you? No, let me explain why. In my uh, meetings with Arabs and Druze, our connection is that we believe in the God of this land. When there's no rain, what does the Arabs say? They pray for rain. God is angry at us. And I say that too. We pray to the same God, and the, the heavens cannot be divided, and the rain cannot be divided, and the land cannot be divided. And I connect my faith to theirs. And when I say to someone, God is with you, I mean that. And in my, and God is with me too. It's not God of the study hall. But I, and Muhammad and Ahmed come with the same feeling and the same God. There are various organizations. And if you want to continue with your autonomy in A and B, go ahead. You want to put your keys on the table? I'm not afraid about of that. I will manage. Things will develop, and arrangements of a new kind will develop because there is a lot of desire to coexist. Of course, there are a lot of people who want to disrupt that, but I'm looking at the majority. They want to live. You didn't answer my question. You heard Amos Gilad and Zahava Galon, and both of them warn of many, so many risks and dangers and warnings. 
And, and you're not afraid of any of that? No. I, my point of departure, you believe in one God? No. My point of departure is there's no arrangements for anything. Secure is just a means. It's not a goal of my existence here. I came here to live in this land. I have no problem with occupation. Occupation, uh, uh, conquest is an important thing for Jews. I have no problem controlling or ruling over another nation. A lot of nations do. In Greece, there are Macedonians and so on. And there are Hungarians in Romania. There are ethnic minorities. You live with it. A country is not a monolith. We have a lot in common with the Palestinians that live here. We're all the children of Abraham. And gradually, and not in one shot, we can achieve coexistence here, which will create a paradise. Amos Gilad, I'm in favor. I'm in favor. Thank you. <laughs> I don't think that there's anything realistic. God is with us, Allah is with them, of course. Although we were here first, I'm not sure that Allah and God agree. And I think we should be practical, find a practical arrangement. We are a single community, and one day they'll demand the right to vote, and if they don't, we'll continue to rule. I'm willing to give up the, the right to vote. As an individual, I don't care about the right to vote. I agree. You know, uh, five acres of olive trees is more important than the right to vote. And I say that from a humanistic perspective. I don't want to talk about olives because I was involved a lot with people stealing olives from uh, other places, from others. We need to decide where we're going. I identify here that politics has taken over and the public doesn't care because it seems far away and there's no terror. What do you mean? What do I mean there's no terror? Harris, who spoke on the previous panel, was in, in charge of the subject of terror. And I once said, thanks, uh, good for you, bravo, but because the ISA prevents terror, we don't have to think about it. How do you invest, how do you measure terror? According to the results of what the ISA does or the intentions of the enemy? There are hundreds and hundreds of attempts of terror. They're getting better all the time, but you don't hear about it because the ISA it has the upper hand. But once, 17 years ago, oh, we didn't have the upper hand. And can't it happen in the future? We're the only smart ones. Anything can happen. We are basing ourselves on excellent intelligence, the ISA, especially the Shabak and uh, military intelligence, the IDF. They're the ones creating the reality, but it's not the reality. And if we become a single community, we'll lose our legitimacy. I constantly repeat that we need to talk about Jordan. I'm worried about Jordan. We don't have a single terrorist from Jordan. There are so many soldiers along the border, and I don't want to say how many because it's confidential information. I mean, there is, there aren't a lot. And we have cooperation, but that cooperation won't work. If there's, and this, uh, Abu Mazen is the last one who is against terror, after him, after him, there'll be another successor, another successor, and they'll eat one another. They'll cooperate with Hamas. Dahlan is kind of suddenly talking about Hamas as his brothers. He was with Sanwar in jail. I believe me, Hamas. Hamas's dream is to cut him up into kebab, and his, when he was, if he were in charge there, he'd be abusing them. The moment he comes back, I suggest him to insure himself with special insurance, and there are many like him. And Abu Mazen makes sure that there is no strong ruler there. You can't just pretend that we're all going to live under our vines and our fig trees forever. We've spoken for a half an hour, and it's been fascinating, but we haven't discussed Trump's uh, deal of the century. Just very quickly, is Trump's deal of the century relevant, or is it just, you know, there'll be another deal and we'll continue arguing among ourselves? I have no idea what Trump's deal of the century is. I don't know who knows what it is. We saw the conference in Bahrain. What I do know is there is an administration 
that works in the service of the current Israeli government and the Israeli right for all kinds of messianic reasons. And I'm not sure that any of them have any grasp in reality. And I think that the damage caused by the Trump administration to the process is much greater than the stagnation we were uh, involved in earlier. But now Netanyahu is, but now we're at the 71th year of Israel. We are a democratic, enlightened state that aspires to equality or, or peace, or are we a one state that is uh, held in the thrall of the right-wing messianics, and we will find ourselves in a situation where not only Palestinians are the immediate uh, victims of this, but uh, all of Israeli society. So two state, one state, what do you see in 20, 30, 40 years? I don't know. I can tell you what I want, what I hope. We all know that already. I can't say. You? I'd like to start with the good news. I'd like to start with the good news. There's a lot of good news. The main good news between us and the Arab states around us is that there's a lot of cooperation under the radar, and there's a lot. We saw it in Bahrain. A lot of business people, they don't have that reservation with us in the past. Egypt, I can say, based on in-depth knowledge, is a strategic ally, and same so is Saudi Arabia and others. That's good news. But what's happening? Can, is that not enough? It's enough. Maybe that's enough. Maybe that's enough. Uh, we had the head of the Mossad here, and everyone wants to be connected with Israel, its technology, its agriculture, and, and so on and so forth. It will continue, and perhaps in the beginning there won't be a violent outburst, and maybe the Palestinians will also fall in love. We'll never be Zionists, and then that will be a challenge to us. That's what I'm afraid of. I think it's a very simple analysis. Let's take the political side of the Trump plan. If he doesn't offer something in order to get married, you need a couple. I don't know. In the future, maybe people will marry robots. But today, you still need a bride and groom of some kind. And what we're doing, we go to the rabbi, and he agrees. We rent a hall, and then afterwards, you go to the bride, and she slaps you in the face. It doesn't work that way. We don't have partners. It's a kind of uh, 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 arrogance, you know, when you if, do you want the Palestinians? Do you want the Jordanians? Do you want an ISA um, agent? No, we need to be concerned by that. There's no discussion of that because nobody cares because everything's quiet. The restaurants are full. The flights are flying out. And they're cheap and full. But all this could change. A process is work slowly, and then you get a surprising event. And that's what I anticipate will happen. Uh, the, there will be a de de things will develop, and it's beyond what we can anticipate on a linear level. But there is potential for a lot of new things. And what happened in Bahrain is a heading for, for things that are happening behind the scenes, which are more important than what's happening in front of the scenes. It's like water that find the potential at the lowest point, so business people are exhausting the business potential, and there's a federative system with Gaza, Judea, and Samaria, and Israel in an entire network of relationships, and this makes this a very great potential. Thank you very much. Thank you to everyone. You're invited to lunch.